Hi everyone, it's Dan and Harvey here from the Perth Young Professionals podcast. Today we're speaking with Dr. Gemma Green. Dr. Gemma Green is the chairman and co-founder of Power Ledger. Power Ledger is a high growth company changing the way consumers buy and sell energy and was the first Australian company to successfully complete an ICO. Gemma was recently named as the EY FinTech Entrepreneur of the Year and is a board member of the Water Corporation of WA. So we welcome Gemma. Awesome. So thanks for joining us, Gem. Thanks for having me. Um, really appreciate your time. Of course, we saw you in, in the newspapers recently for all the awards that you're winning and, um, you know, the EY FinTech uh, Entrepreneur of the Year. That's a pretty, pretty awesome award. Um, and, I and, agree. And, con and congratulations. <laughs> congratulations for that, for sure. I um, also saw online you, you won uh, one of Richard Branson's uh, Extreme Tech Challenges. Yes. And um, yeah, congratulations for that. Thank you. Yeah, it was pretty amazing to be given the crown by Sir Richard Branson on his island. Uh, and I just had a baby three months earlier, so my family <laughs> came out with me um, to help. My husband came and the kids. So yeah, it was a pretty amazing experience. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, we might just get started with in terms of power leisure and, of course, you're the founder and, and um, the person right, really driving it right at the top. So, um, you know, can you can you briefly explain what is Power Ledger's mission? At, you know, simply. Sure. Um, our mission is to deliver low cost and low carbon efficient energy and carbon markets, awesome. and we have a product portfolio of three areas. One is energy trading, the other is energy asset financing, and the third is carbon credit and uh, renewable energy certificate trading. Awesome. And so far we've got projects in Australia, Thailand, Japan, and the US. Wow, that's impressive. And of course, recently you guys had your ICO um, as- Token generation a, event. A token generation event, um, which was you know, wonderful to see something being championed in Perth. Um, something like this, and we really wanted to understand um, two things. Really, that what, the first question is: Why was the ICO required for Power Ledger? What's the what's the um, the driver behind that? Mm. And and then also, secondly, um, why did you opt to generate your own token as opposed to you know Bitcoin or Ethereum? Certainly. So Power Ledger was formed three years ago, well before the ICO craze that you saw in the market, pretty much you know, in 2017. And um, we had developed a platform, an application, and we had projects in Australia and New Zealand, and we were seeing what was going on in the market where lots of companies with merely an idea were out um, you know, issuing tokens and raising money off essentially, you know, vaporware. And we thought, well, we're, we're actually in a bit of a different category. And we could actually see the need for uh, a token that would facilitate trading on the platform um, in the form of a, a license and a bond. Mm -hmm. In electricity markets, it takes two to three months for buyers and sellers, sellers to settle payments with each other. And as a result of that, they have to put up collateral in the wholesale market. Yeah. And um, using the blockchain, it's possible to shrink that settlement time and therefore shrink the need for collateral. And we're using the power token as a form of bond or collateral. Um, so power token can be used by utilities um, as a license and a bond to facilitate energy trading in their markets. And we realised that, that there was a valid reason to have a token in this instance and that we were perhaps more progressed than many other companies in other sectors and indeed our own. And so we just thought we would give it a go. And uh, initially we were looking at where it had, what countries it had been done in and it would have been easier to do it overseas. But we really wanted to try and establish a market here. And um, we got advice that it was possible to do that. And so we, we decided to undertake Australia's first initial coin offering. And we were fortunate enough to raise about 34 million Australian dollars. Now, now speaking of you know the sort of journey from you know three years ago, one of the things that at least closer closer to my heart is you know sustainability and renewable energy. Um, and funnily enough, I did some volunteer work at Cusp uh, back at uh, Curtin University, and um, you yes. know 
your colleague uh, James was my supervisor at the time. Yes, so, I remember. So could you take us through the journey from, you know, three years ago, journey not only of Power Ledger, but, but your journey as well? Certainly. So um, I returned to Perth in 2012 after 11 years in London working in investment banking. And there are no investment banks here in Perth. And between leaving London and coming back here, I took a sabbatical about nine months and went hiking. And I got this idea to try and build an eco village. And it was a bit of a crazy idea, but eventually I shared it with a friend in Europe who said, you should reach out to Professor Peter Newman at Curtin University. And so I did and uh, wrote to him by email and said, I'm a returning Western Australian. I'd like to build an eco village in Perth. And he wrote back immediately and said, that's a great idea. You should do it in Fremantle and copy it in the mayor. And upon my return to Perth, I had lunch with the mayor, met with Peter, and he said, look, you know, this could be a PhD research project and uh, I can get you a scholarship with the Cooperative Research Centre for Low Carbon Living, which he did. And so Peter was my PhD supervisor and my research is in electricity market disruption. And I saw that in Australia, 30% of houses have rooftop solar, but apartments had hardly any, which represent mm -hmm. about half of the new housing stock and 30% of the existing housing stock. And But the law that governs them meant that they could actually sell electricity within the building without a retail electricity license, which was quite exciting because then you could create a shared solar and shared battery system and facilitate trading. Yes. But I couldn't find software that would create that um, transactive environment and I was a bit stuck to be honest with you and by chance a former banking colleague of mine emailed me and introduced me to a couple of people that worked in the blockchain in Perth and they met me I just had my first child seven weeks earlier so they came to my house and were telling me about the blockchain and I was a bit bamboozled and confused to be honest with you and they were trying to tell me that it was you know this game-changing technology and I was a bit suspicious, but subsequent to the meeting, I looked online and saw that there were applications in electricity and I put them in touch with Dave Martin and he got really excited and thought, not only could it create this transactive environment in apartment buildings or buildings, it could do that across the grid. And uh, he said, I want to set up a company. Do you want to join me? And I said, yes. So that's how Power Ledger was formed really with those two um, signature products in mind, the trading of energy across grids and within a micro grids or embedded networks. And yeah, so uh, Curtin University and Peter Newman are a really big part of this story. And, you know, my applied research there really helped to identify the problems in the market and the opportunities that the blockchain might um, help to solve. Awesome. I think that's, that's so interesting that you know, Frio has become the, the center, the epicenter of, you know, the sustainability movement. Mm. Um, maybe you can tell us a bit about the project. I mean, I know personally about it, but, um, you know, how, how amazingly sustainable that um, the work that's going on and, and the living that, that can be, um, you know, brought into the future of construction and the future of housing. Can you just tell us a bit about, you know, what you guys are doing there? Certainly. So I think it's really significant. I mentioned that um, 30 percent of the existing housing stock is apartments and 50 percent of new housing stock is apartments or strata and what that says is that we've got a trend uh, of this new type of land assembly which is driving the housing market yeah. and that is a reflection of the the densification of cities and smaller lots and things like this so it's not just apartment buildings it could be strata lots or townhouses within a particular development um, and as a result of this um, we're having a lot more people living in a particular geographical area. And what that means to the electricity grid is that you might have to upgrade substations and transformers to deal with that. And that's very expensive for a property developer to have yeah. to pay for that. As an alternative, they could put in batteries and reduce the overall demand on the network in the peak periods and avoid having to um, fund that. And so it can actually feed into the business case to put in these alternatives yeah. on site. But it actually is not just a cost saving exercise, it changes the product proposition to the market. So people want to buy sustainable homes, but there hasn't actually been a sustainable offering in uh, apartments or in that strata um, sort of segment of the market. It's mainly been freehold houses that have put on solar and um, now beginning batteries. But I think that it presents an economic opportunity for the developers to drive out costs 
and put a more sustainable offering. And we know that the market wants to buy this. So I think it's very exciting um, in that we can start to see these solar and battery systems that are actually community scale as opposed to small, which are actually more suitable, um, easier to manage and look after. If you think about you know, tens of thousands of batteries in houses versus community scale batteries, you get economies of scale and it, it's better to kind of get a you know, particular contractor looking after a particular, you know, an asset. Yeah, yeah. And so I think there's all kinds of benefits from looking at community scale solar and batteries and that the property development market may drive what our energy system looks like over the next five to 10 years as a result of that. Okay, I suppose that's easier as well because you're just dealing with a microgrid and the developer and you don't necessarily have to deal with the regulator and the owner of the, the network. So you do need to still get permission to add these assets on and sure. connect them to the grid um, or can put, put them into the system. But uh, I think it is a far more straightforward proposition overall. Mm -hmm. And it does mm. provide the economic imperative to look at doing something like that, particularly in constrained parts of the network. So th those land that is constrained by either water or electricity or gas has more cost, sunk cost in it to get it to market. But that could actually make it a more attractive proposition for these alternative energies. And then our platform means that you can create a simple way that, that residents can transact with each other and have their billing and it's really transparent. It's a bit like, you know, when you go to a restaurant with your friends and some people have entrees, main course, dessert and two bottles of wine and others just have a main and then the bill comes out and you've got that tedious moment where someone either gets out their calculator uh, or everyone goes with the bill and for those that haven't had much, it's not really a dinner party you want to go to all that often. And what the blockchain does is provide a simple and transparent way of managing that, you know. Yeah. So, so if I've got a solar panel on my roof, but you don't, you mm. can, it allows you to buy the excess capacity from me. Correct, yeah. correct, yeah. yeah. Um, and in the case of our project in Fremantle, we just put in a 670 kilowatt hour battery to that site and there'll be 36 homes and they will be able to trade with each other via the battery. So the battery will store electricity during the day and then the residents can purchase it back at night. Um, and I think that this will be a new model for how developments are done in the future. Yeah, I think so. It's, and it's great. It's great that it's happening here in Perth as well. I think that's, that's a very inspiring story. Um, okay, so this is kind of where Power Ledger has come from mm. and what you're doing now. Um, let's talk about you know the next couple of years. What, in terms of goals and and mm. and the the horizon in the future? What does what are you looking at uh, as Power Ledger and and maybe some personal goals as well? What are you looking at as a leader, as as a mum or etc. Yeah, sure. So I mentioned our product portfolio does three things. We use the blockchain to facilitate trading of electricity, the financing of energy projects and carbon markets. And most of the projects to date have really been around the energy trading suite. Um, but we'll be launching our energy asset financing product in the next couple of months and it's called Asset Germination. And we fractionalise assets on the blockchain. So the battery in Fremantle will be fractionalised and sold to the market and everyday people can own a piece of that in a tokenised format. Wow. Um, and so I think this is exciting because um, the International Renewable Energy Agency has said that investment in renewables needs to be scaled up six times faster for the world to meet the Paris climate goals. And this is pioneering a product that brings in new sources of capital. There's not really a lot of options for retail investors to invest in um, community scale renewables. And so we think this platform will um, provide new opportunities to bring in capital from that part of the market. Mm -hmm. And if they have been able to invest in the, the they've been fairly illiquid. And what that means is you can't trade them very easily. Mm -hmm. But in tokenizing the assets, they can become tradable on a token exchange. And I think that makes investments more attractive when they're mm -hmm. more liquid. Mm -hmm. And then the third area is carbon markets. And we've got a demonstration project in California with Silicon Valley Power that we just announced our successful completion of. And that's about automating the process to get carbon credits issued. Um, we've connected to the second largest electric vehicle charging station in California which is powered by solar, and um, they're eligible for a carbon credit called the Low Carbon Fuel Standard. 
but getting the credit was actually a very manual and tedious process and using our platform we automated that. That's the first part. The second part is actually tokenizing carbon credits and again creating mm. a liquid and exchange based trading market. By contrast, what it is right now is broker, broker led. And so what that means is if you've got a solar farm and you're eligible for credits, you need to find someone to buy them. Typically, you'll have what's called an aggregator, hopefully knock on your door, and then you'll need to get a legal contract in place to sell them to the aggregator, who then sell them to a broker, who then sell them to the buyer. And then that whole process takes quite a long time, and there's a lot of cost involved in terms of um, mm. fees and charges from the counterparties, legal costs. And then when um, the final settlement happens, there's the middle and back office costs from yeah. settling the trades, yep. and it could be as much as 10 or 15% of the value of the certificates. But I think that the opportunity with the blockchain is around connecting to the smart meters and automating that process to issue the credit and then having it be on an exchange um, that can be where the trade is the, the payment uh, and uh, create a far more efficient market wow. and a more transparent and liquid one. Because in broker markets, it's sometimes hard to know um, what the actual prices are and how much liquidity is in the market yeah. as well. And so I think that if we want to move towards efficient markets and drive out unnecessary cost, I think the blockchain could offer a lot to carbon. And we've just um, formed a new partnership in the US with a, a large developer that has about five gigawatts of installed capacity of renewables and a pipeline of a further nine gigawatts to help develop a renewable energy certificate trading market um, in the US yeah. with them. Wow. So that is about um, us really um, pushing ahead with the carbon credit um, part of our product portfolio. Yeah. So you're really breaking down a few barriers here. I mean, you know, I thought the point that you made around how hard it is to invest in a renewable energy project. Like if someone said to me, oh, go and find me a renewable energy project that you can invest in from a retail perspective, that would be really hard. And yes. if you wanted to invest, you'd need a lot of money to do it. Correct. So if you can make that available to everyday mums and dads to go and chip in and contribute to community projects, I just think that's remarkable. Yeah, I think it's very exciting because we, yeah. we, we know that consumers want to invest in these kinds of assets because they are already yeah. um, but that there is the potential for them to put in additional funds and get a return for doing so and i think that there will be appetite in the market for doing that but i guess the proof will be in the investment pudding yeah, <laughs> yeah. so um, you, you've obviously achieved a lot in a fairly short period of time how, how hard has it been building what is a pretty innovative business so we're three years old this month, and um, we have achieved a lot. But I feel like there's so you know there's so much more to do to really scale and commercialise the business. Most of the projects that we've done to date have been proof of concept, sure. or we've got one commercial trial um, in Thailand working with BCPG, and that's peer-to-peer -peer trading in Bangkok in the T77 precinct, and that's just under one megawatt trading right now between a shopping centre, um, a hospital apartment buildings and um, uh, further three or four hundred kilowatts will be added to that in the coming months and it's actually the largest commercial peer-to-peer -peer trading project in the world right now but that says something that the market's not mature it is a nascent market but I think we'll see start to see that inflection point with scale mm. this year and we're already starting to see that so for example in Thailand, we've got just under one megawatt right now, but we'll add four megawatts in the next quarter and 12 in the following quarter. Um, but I think that we'll, these projects will start to add more users, megawatt hours to the platform, carbon to the platform. And I think that's where we'll start to see the real benefits of the blockchain start to drive change in the market. And the hope is, I mean, you asked me at the beginning about what our mission is, and it, it really is to make a meaningful contribution to the Paris climate goals and also impact the lives of a billion people. And so that involves scale. I think for, for us as a company, we're really mission focused around those things. Have you made any um, decisions around which markets you're going to focus on, i.e. geographically? So you talked about Thailand. Are there, is it going to be primarily developed countries, developing, or just talk me through that? Well, we've just secured two projects in Europe, which will be our first in the European market. We've got projects now in Asia and the US and Australia. Interestingly, 
I think there's different opportunities in different places. In places like Thailand, where they, they've got issues around particulate matter, they want to um, deal with the pollution in their air and there's a big driver to install renewables. There's about four gigawatts in their system right now, but it's going to double over the next five years. And they have only a voluntary carbon market, so there's the potential to create a compliance market as well. Whereas in the US, there's actually 34 unique REPS markets in different states. Um, and then you've got the LCFS market and the cap and trade. So they've got existing schemes that maybe will become more efficient by using technologies like the blockchain, whereas places like Thailand may leapfrog just to those from the get-go. Uh, and in Australia, I think there's big opportunities around microgrids and even the efficient trading of um, carbon credits here. So I think that the countries that we're in right now are where we've had inbound queries and we've responded to those and forged relationships, but we now have a pretty good view where we do see opportunities for scale and commercialization and we're really just dating those markets right now. Interesting. Um, I, I mentioned earlier about you know, your award with uh, Richard Branson, so Richard Branson, of course, the Extreme Tech Award, and I wanted to know, uh, you know obviously meeting him and, and all the other contestants and, and competitors, uh, what did you take from, from, from that experience and, and is there anything that you really could share with our listeners? Well, uh, when Sir Richard Branson gave us the crown, he said that he was actually at the Paris Climate Talks and that it was important for, you know, for us to put our best efforts to try and solve the climate crisis and um, that in spite of Powledge's young age, um, we've made a lot of progress and that he wanted to support us in the work that we were doing, which was really heartening. And I mean, the thing that Does struck- Does that mean he's gonna write you a really big check? Uh -huh. Well, I haven't asked him, <laughs> but um, I, I, we are going to give him an update so you know where we're at. So um, yeah, I'm excited about that. Yeah. But he, he was a very humble person and very understated. When I first met him and was chatting with him, Oh, at the blockchain summit in 2017 on, his, on Necker Island, uh, he said, oh, I'm going to make myself a cup of tea. Do you want one? And I said, oh, okay. And so he went and made me a cup of tea. And he was actually a very awkward person. Like, you know, he's quite shy. And then you realize, oh, he's just as nervous talking to you as, you know, I was to him. Yeah. So it was quite, it was just, um, yeah, it was just really amazing to see how yeah, a decent everyday person he was and he was walking around you know in barefoot in his board shorts that's cool yeah. yeah but one thing that i did notice about him in having like read his books about his life is that he really prioritized having fun and uh that he didn't see that as separate for you know him making money and doing business and you can see that in terms of the you know he's really into outdoor sports and extreme sports and he'd like to do exciting you know, dead things. It's not necessarily all of my cup of tea, but it did kind of instill in me the idea that, yeah, I mean, I love what I do, but I think that it's good to kind of create the contrast and you've got to realize it's a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah, agreed, agreed. I think, um, you know, the idea of fun and creativity and how that flows over into our professional lives is something that I've discussed previously um, on the podcast. How, how have you found, um, you know, being creative, how, how, how has that impacted or impacted your business? Um, and how do you find ways to be creative in your business or in your professional life? Uh, I think the, having an obsession with the problems and trying to solve them, that, you know, thinking about things a lot and deeply, that helps you try and figure out how to solve those problems. And, uh, you know, I love this business and the work that we're doing and, the, and pioneering these new technologies and seeing if it might actually, you know, make a big impact. So I think that's a big motivator. Also, you know, wanting to establish a business that means I can um, be based in Perth and, you know, provide new economic op opportunities for Western Australia. That's something that really motivates me as well. I have two small children and, you know, it's hard being a mum and, you know, working, but I feel like I'm trying to do something that will leave a better world for my kids without wanting to sound a cliche, but it does, you know, when you're away from your kids having to work, you want it to be for a good reason. Um, and so like, I'm going to Thailand this afternoon and I'm taking my 10 month old son with me and 
you know, it's a bit chaotic traveling with children, but um, with my, I've got a three-year-old daughter and she, I think I went on about 25 trips with her under two because I, I, I was nursing her and also I just didn't want to be away from her. So you kind of, it creates a more loosely ordered chaos is what I would say. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you just could do what you got to do. Awesome. I think, I think that's a, it's a challenge that many working mums have and being the founder of such a big uh, business that's taken off, um, I, I can't imagine, you know, how, how you balance things, but, um, you know, what's your approach to balancing your, your work life and... Well, uh, I, in the, I try and get, I cook most evenings and I try and spend the evenings with my children, get them into bed and then do work afterwards. And um, they come to the office a fair amount as well. I've got a nanny and there's activities that the kids can do in town together, like go to the library, there's rhyme time. And we've got obviously Kings Park in the city, which is a yeah. wonderful, it's got great uh, children's playgrounds. Um, you know, and I take my kids to a toddler jam activity on Thursdays. And so, yeah, just, you just try and, um, and make sure that on the weekends that you take some time just to focus on them and, and yeah. Yeah, not be on your phone. It's, yeah. You know, you, you've got to really make sure that you give them the attention that they deserve and they need as well. Thanks for listening to the first half of this podcast. Keep an eye out for the second half coming soon.